Uh, if you've not been here, we are closing out our 21 Days of Prayer series. We've been giving different prompts all throughout the last 21 days online, uh, and we're bringing it to a close today. Chris and Matt have done an incredible job over the last two weeks sharing with us how to pray, what to pray, uh, what God does in the midst of prayer, what that looks like, what to expect. Uh, and if you weren't here, Go back and listen to it, all right, because it was really good, and you missed it, all right, and I'm going to be uh, integrating some of it into the message here this morning, but I don't have anywhere near enough time to properly go back and recap it if you haven't been here to listen to it, uh, because it really does uh, set us up for today, and so with all that we understand about prayer, there's a question that needs to be asked in our minds, what do we do with it next, and so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So last week, Matt shared uh, you know, about what it looks like when we ask God for prayers and what the answering, how we should expect him to answer our prayers. And if you were here at the closing, when I did the closing, I challenge you to come back and you can win at the game of prayer, right? And I don't know if you were offended at that, and it probably doesn't really bother me a whole lot if you were. Um, but before you get offended at that and somehow think that I'm somehow sacrilegious and comparing prayer to a game, uh, listen to the message today and just understand the heart behind why I say that because we're going to talk about praying the will of God and taking out the mystery. I don't know about you, but I don't, I just, sometimes I just want things to be black and white. And God gave us some very clear black and white answers about prayer in the scriptures. And unfortunately, uh, as followers of Christ, we oftentimes miss it uh, because we're so consumed in the gray area that we miss the very black and white area that God tells us to be praying for. So that's what I want to focus on today is what is it that he tells us specifically to do in prayer? And, uh, and we'll, we'll go there in a second. But I want to recap the, the passage that kind of kicks this off and what we're really focusing on and what the foundational verse is for this series. And it's what the early church was doing, all right? This was when the first church started to break out after Christ came to the earth and the way was started. Um, this is what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings just like you're doing here. We are not apostles. We're simply people with like you, but we're teaching you, all right? And to the fellowship, you're in fellowshipping. And to the breaking of bread, I don't know. Are you in a life group? Do you break bread and eat together? I don't know. And to prayer, that's what the early church was doing. This idea of prayer, it was something that was expected. It was part of the early church's daily existence. It was what they did. So as a church, you and I, we are called to this idea of prayer. We're called, if you were here the last couple of weeks, Chris and Matt both talked about this idea of praying continually and, and incessantly, like it's, it's part of who we are. Is it really what is a part of your life? Last week, Matt challenged us on uh, what to expect when we're praying, and I'm just going to wrap up his message, and if you don't like the way I wrapped it up, go back and listen to him. He did a better job, but I'm going to wrap it up in this statement right here. We have to believe that God always answers prayers. He does. He always answers prayers but to accept that it's not always how we expect, want, or hope, all right? We have to accept that it's not always how we expect, want, or hope, and generally never in our timing, all right? And so that's also very true today with what I'm going to say. Even though I'm going to tell you how to win at prayer, it's never it when you think you should be crossing the finish line, all right? So just remember that out of the gate this morning. Um, so I'm going to tell you praise in such a way that you will know what it is that God wants for your life. How can you know specifically? How can I even stand up here and tell you that I know that you could know what God wants for you? So if you jump to the passage just before our foundational verse, uh, we get to see a picture of what, were the, what kind of prayer, what was happening in the early church's life, what was going on that they were experiencing, and they were devoting so much of their time to spending to, with one another and to the, their prayer lives, right? So we're going to go back up to Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 36, and it says this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. All right? Pretty strong message there. Uh, when the people heard this, they were mad at them, and they crucified them. No. When they heard that Jesus was the Lord and Messiah, they were cut to their heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, okay, well, what do we do? They had this interaction with Jesus, and their life was changed in that moment. Keep going. 
And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Matt and Chris both talked about the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you give your life to Christ, He is a part of your life. Our prayers are infused through the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep going. This promise is for you, so the current people that they are being talked to, and your children, and for all who are far off. We would be the ones that are far off, right? For all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, that means he was a long-winded preacher. He warned them, (laughs) and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. I get so tired of hearing Christians say, man, we're just going down. It's just so corrupt anymore. Folks, it's been corrupt for a really, really, really long time. All right, God has always called his church to be the light in a corrupt world. All right, that's the challenge of the church. We got to stop bemoaning and thinking for some reason that all of a sudden the world is more corrupt than it's ever been. It's just not. Noah, have you read the flood? Good Lord. Keep going. So those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That day. Man, they were they were seeing people added to their numbers daily. And that's what they were praying for, that this kingdom of God would be advanced into this world, that this freedom, we just sang about the freedom. If you've really been set free, wouldn't you tell someone else how they could be free? But I think a lot of times we don't even know what the freedom is because we're so focused on ourselves that we forgot what God did for us. And he gave us this message of freedom to declare to the world. So, I want to challenge you with this. We're experiencing the advancement of God as well. But go to the next slide. God tells us what he wants throughout his scriptures. He tells us that this is what he wants. He wants his kingdom to be advanced. He wants his name to be glorified in the nations. He wants all people to be saved. He wants the message to go out to all and all those who are far off. But the question is, do you spend more time praying for what you want Do you spend more time praying for what others want? Intercessory prayer, you know, good intercessory prayer. You know, we just spend our time on our knees begging God for what other people want. Or do we, and and don't get mad at me yet, please. Or do we spend time on our knees asking God for what he wants? You see, as humans, we are some of the most selfish creatures that ever walked on this earth. We think that somehow or another, God is there to answer our beck and call. Folks, if you, if you just listen to what we, the words we use, we, we use Lord and kingdom. We are his servants. He is our God. He is the God above all gods. His name is higher than all names. And at his name, every knee will bow. All right? We are serving the creator of the universe, and we think somehow or another he is there to do as we wish. We are here to carry out his purpose and advance his kingdom. That's how I know when you pray, like what I'm going to challenge you to pray, you will hear God and see God answer your prayers because your focus is not going to be on you, it's going to be on him. Yeah, you guys don't get it yet. I can trust me. I'm stepping on some toes. All right. Now, don't get me wrong. Okay, I have seen people healed. I have I have anointed people with oil. In fact, if you're sitting on the end rows, you can see my little crosses. I go. If you see oil marks on everything, that's me. Why? Because I believe in the power of prayer. I have anointed people with oil before. I have seen people healed before my very eyes. I have seen a blind woman healed till the day she was died. She was an old woman. She just wanted to be able to quilt. She asked me to pray for her. I did. She was healed. I've seen God do amazing things. I've seen curses brought down. I've seen curses lifted. I've seen demons cast out. I have seen God do amazing things through the power of prayer. But it's never consistent. It's never consistent. And that's why I'm not going to get up here and tell you how to, how to pray prayers like that and get them answered every time. Because I'd be a false witness. It doesn't happen all the time. Because I can, I've, count, I've prayed for a lot more, and they all died. Why? I don't know. That's a question for God. But what I do know, what I do know, is that when I pray what I do pray, 
about advancing his kingdom, he answers. And so if you could get inside my head and get past the disturbing parts, all right, all right, then you could actually get to the prayer and you can see what I pray for. 70%, and I say 70% because I would like to say it's higher, but I'm going to give myself some, I know it's at least 70%, is never about me. God says he knows what I need before I ever pray it. So I don't even need to pray about me. I never do. I'm like, whatever. I deserve whatever I get. So God, just do what you want because you know what you got. But God, used me to advance your kingdom. Use me to inspire others. Use me to witness to the people that you want me to witness to. God, soften their hearts that they will understand what it is that you want to do in their lives. That's where 70% of my time is spent in prayer. So I challenge you, we have to pray. We have to pray that God will open doors for us to bring people into his kingdom. If we are really children of a king, if we, are really, if we have really been set free, we want to be dragging people into our kingdom with us because we serve a benevolent God. We serve a God who wants all men to be saved. We serve a God who doesn't want anyone to perish. And if we really believe that, we would want to spend time bringing them to the kingdom that we know is going to save their life. But so much of our time is spent not focused upon that. Jesus did it like this, Matthew chapter 9, it says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. There is good news when our king reigns and healing every disease and sickness. Keep going. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were living in a corrupt world. And he knew they needed something, and he's telling them, guys, you can come with me. And he, and he was like, you all need to come into my kingdom because a king was considered a shepherd, and he knew that he was the great shepherd, and in his kingdom, his sheep were going to be cared for. Keep going. Then he said to his disciples, guys, the harvest is plentiful. There are so many helpless sheep out there. There are so many people deceived. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask, pray, and pray to the Lord of the harvest. Who is he telling them to pray to? Him. Pray to him. Pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. That's what God's telling us to pray for. God, send out workers into the harvest field. That's what he wants us to do. The harvest is plentiful. Have you seen the harvest? Have you lived out there in that world? People are walking far from God. I don't know if you know that. Maybe some of you are far from God here this morning, and, I'm, and you don't even like what I'm saying right now. God wants you. He's inviting you to his kingdom. He wants you to join him. People are being deceived by the corruptness of the world around them. In Jesus' time, just like today, we're no more corrupt than they were. Keep going to the next passage. So if this happens, if, if we, if any of you have called yourself a child of God, if you've come into the kingdom of God, if you're living with Jesus Christ as your Lord, if you genuinely believe he is your king and you are his servant, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. You actually have a, you have a new passport. You've been given a new name, all right? Everything is new. The old is gone. The old you is gone. In Revelation, it even says you have a new name written down. This new name comes with a new passport to get into a new kingdom. The old has gone, the new is here. Keep going. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us that ministry to tell other people how they can get a new passport in. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Do you realize that Christians, we spend the majority of our time damning people and telling them how rotten they are? Yeah, look at Facebook, all right? Look at how stalwart of a faith some of us Christians have in condemning the world around us. Good Lord, do you think they're going to join you on your mission into the kingdom of God? They hate you, and you hate them, and God loves them. He didn't even count there. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Man, we got to change the way we look at people. We got to start looking at them as they need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. I need Jesus because I'm them. I was one of them. I'm no better than anybody else. Keep going. And he has committed us, this message, us, you and I, this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 
This part is so convicting. We are his ambassadors so much though, so that it's as if God were making his appeal through us. He's depending upon us, the church, to make his appeal about his kingdom, the good news. He's trusting us with that message. Now, I don't know why he did that, all right? Trust me, I don't know. It's kind of confusing to me because we're really not very trustworthy. But he did it. He gave it to us. And he invites us to join him. That's the beautiful part. He's already paved the way. He's created the best kingdom ever. So we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. That's the first thing you got to do. You got to make sure that you have it first. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, please take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. All right? (laughs) You need Jesus first. There's a kingdom that God wants you to be a part of. And you're probably not a Christian because you've seen how the rest of us live inside that kingdom and you've been turned off a little bit, all right? I get that. So I'm trying to help clean up the mess on the other side a little bit. And if you come into it, you're going to bring your own mess with it and then it's going to be bad again. And so the good thing is we're serving God and he doesn't count any of it against any of us, all right? That's his kingdom. So if you're here and you don't have that, then that's the first thing you got to take care of this morning. But we're ambassadors of that message. That message of freedom that when we come in, we don't have to worry about how messed up we are, how many sins we've committed. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to to share that message in the world. And he, he challenges us, pray that God will send you out. Pray that God will open up doors into the harvest field for you to share this message of reconciliation. It's the actionable part of the prayer life that Matt and Chris have been talking about the last two weeks. Right, so if we, have, we pray to this great God, there's action steps that are expected here. And this is, this is part of that action that God wants for us. Look, if you remember, they talked about the transformation that happens in our minds. I want to go ahead and read that passage out of Romans 12. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. This, this transformation, when we give our lives to Christ, when we, when we make him our Lord and Savior, there's a literal transformation that happens in the way that we think. Matt and Chris both talked about the, the fact that the Holy Spirit changes us. We begin to view things differently. This is that transformation. Uh, go back, though, real quick. When we, when we change like that, we're able to test and approve what God's will is. This is when that, when that happens, we're able to pray in the way that God wants us to pray. Why? Because we know what his will is for our lives. It's not a mystery. He's not, he's not some genie up there. He's not some big gray-haired God just waiting for life to be a mystery and he wants to keep it a secret from us. That's what I think so many people view God as. He tells us we will know it. When we, when we pray like this, we can know what God's will is, his pleasing and perfect will. That is what God wants to do in our lives. This transformation allows us to align our will with his will. Go back and listen to the last two messages because they did a great job talking about that. But when that happens, our prayers begin to change. Look at uh, 1 Timothy. It says this, I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Help them do what? Keep reading. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Thank God for all those people in your life that are living far from him. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Now, I don't know if you're aware of who was king when Paul was writing this. He was not a good guy. In fact, he had Paul killed. All right? So we intercede on their behalf, and we give thanks to God for them, and we pray for them. Okay? I'm not going down the political realm right now. Just study Paul, all right? So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and integrity. Now look at what he was praying for. Watch this. Keep going. This is good and pleases God our Savior. The good and pleasing will of God, Romans chapter 12. This is where he says, you will know the will of God. Here it is. He wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth the good and pleasing will, that everyone will be saved and understand the truth. That is his will. That is the will of God. He wants everyone to understand that. And look at what he did. Watch. 
For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. That's who we are ambassadors of. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Freedom for all who live in his community, in his kingdom. This is the message that God gave to the world at just the right time. At just the right time. Are we still living in just the right time? I believe we are. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we praying that God will send out workers into this harvest field at just the right time to declare his message of hope, to declare this message of freedom to all those who are living far away from him? And are we giving thanks for those who are living far from him? Because Christ died for them. Are we trying to build bridges where they'll come into the kingdom of God, or are we trying to bar the gates so that they can't get close to us? Folks, we got to start looking at the lost world with a different lens. And when we start praying like this, he will change you from the inside out. That's why I can guarantee you he will open up these doors of opportunity. Why? Because it's very clear in the scripture, he wills that all men be saved. So he will open up doors of opportunity. Now, he may not do it in your time, all right? He may not do it when you think you're going to do it. You may have a meeting with that person and you may, God, this will be the perfect time. He's like, no, it's going to be about five years from now, but you keep praying. All right. Are you committed? Are you committed to praying that long? Because his time, one of the verses, it's a thousand years, is like a day to him. All right. So he's not as in a hurry as we are. So Matt and I, uh, you hear us talk about this training material that we do, Cyprus down in Haiti. But one of the questions that we do with this material, and I love this question, it's so convicting, don't answer it. Okay. Just pretend like we know the answer, all right? Go ahead and let me see the question. It says, uh, how many people would have been added to the kingdom of God this week? Don't, not, not this month, just this week. So from Sunday when Matt preached last week till right now I'm preaching, how many specific people did you pray for? And how many, if we added all of them up in here, how many new people would be in the kingdom this week? Okay, now, you multiply your number by how many ever people are in here, okay? Some of you, there might be a lot of people saved. Others of you, it's easy to multiply zero. It's convicting. And even when we go to Haiti, it's convicting. When I ask it myself, it's convicting. Why? Because in our prayer lives, we're so focused upon ourselves. That's why. It's not here to condemn us. It's here to challenge us. It's here to convict us that God has so much more for his children. He invites us to be a part of this. That's the story of the good news. At Journey, we challenge you to pick five people, our top five, right? We challenge you to pick five people that you know are, are living far from God, all right? And then start praying for them by name specifically and watch God do amazing things. And here's what happens. You're praying for these five, and he brings you five that weren't even on your list because you're so in tune with the kingdom, you're so in tune with his will, that you start, he's changing you, and you start seeing everybody else that is wanting God and needing God and wants to be invited into the kingdom. This, it happens, I, I just can't even tell you how often this happens. It just happened to me on Tuesday. All right? I, me and this other guy, we've been praying for a, a, an individual, and uh, we set up a time to meet, and it very seldom ever happens like this this quickly. And we're at Famous Toastry on Tuesday morning, and we get done talking, and I'm just like, do you, do you want to know Jesus? Yeah. Like right now? Uh-huh. You want to pray right now here at the table? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. We did. Another, another person into the kingdom of God. Why? Because God's inviting us all. Yeah, you could have said amen. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah, you can praise God. The, the Bible says the angels rejoice in heaven. All right. So yeah, there you go. It's good. It was God. We just, I just was a part of it. I'm a nobody. God wants you to be a part of these conversations. He invites us all. I don't know if you realize this. He invites us all to be his workers. He says we are given this ministry of reconciliation. This is a privilege. It's not a task. It's not a challenge. This is, if I've been set free, I get to tell people about the freedom that the Holy Spirit gives me. It's not an obligation. It's a privilege. And there are people all around us that need this message. And we might wonder, well, the Lord's coming back soon. The world's really corrupt. You want to know something? 
Every time I hear that phrase, I leave, I, I, this verse goes off in my mind. Go to the next passage. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. I don't know if you know this, but it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus said he's coming back. Okay, 2,000 years. I know America is important. I know, so it's probably going to come during our time because the Bible says when America goes down and the republic collapses, that Jesus' return is imminent. If you find that passage, please let me know. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to... He has painted such a clear picture for what his will is. He's like, I'm not even coming back, guys. I'm not even telling my son when he's coming back. Because I don't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We can know his good and pleasing will. The day's coming when we won't have the opportunity to share this message anymore. All right? Because Jesus will return. I promise. He will. I don't know when, but he told us he will. And he doesn't lie, so he's coming back. But until that moment, until the moment he comes back, this is the truth. You are a missionary. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, we read it in 2 Corinthians 5.17, you are a missionary. You're either leading people to Christ or leading people away from Christ. That's up to you. But the reality is, the moment we accept Christ... We are leading people into his kingdom that God doesn't want anybody to perish. And he's going to be, he is so desperate for it that he will delay his return for one. He was willing to not destroy a kingdom. I'm not even going to tell you the number. When Abraham prayed, you, how, many, or how many people was he willing to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for if, Lot could have just, if Abraham could have just found them? Yeah. He's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. What are you praying for in your prayer life? We have, I don't know if you know this, but we have three, we call ourselves in our mission work, we call them strategic partners. We have three very strong strategic partners across the world, our international uh, partners. We have TKP in Kilgoris, Kenya. All right? We have Hovde House in Huanaco, Peru. We have Mission of Hope in Haiti. Uh, they're located in Titayan, but we actually, they're so large in, Mich in Haiti that we partner with a single village called Travaux. That money that you just gave at the end of the year, it went directly to Travaux. Are you praying for our mission work in these countries? Are you asking God to have, to open up these doors for our missionaries to go there? Are you asking God to open up the freaking borders again so we can travel to these countries yet again? Is that part of your prayer life, that we would have the opportunity to advance the kingdom of God in these other countries? If you've never been to TKP, we partner with the Winds of Grace churches over there. They plant churches, and I'm telling you what, are you praying for David Lamiso and, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on all the names, but uh, if I weren't standing up here, I'd remember their names, all right? So are you praying for them? They have really cool names like Moses and Elijah and they name, they've got all the Bible names. Are you praying for them that God will open up doors? Are you praying for our teachers that they lead the kids to Christ and the schools that we partner with over there? Or are we so focused upon what's just happening in our own lives that we lose sight of the life transformation that God wants to do in his kingdom? Church, I can share with you personal story of how many times God has answered these prayers in my own life over and over again. But it's not about my story. It's about your story it's about what God wants to do in your life because this is the truth. God wants to use you right where you are, in your home. You were born at this time for a purpose, to be a harvest worker for him. He wants to use you. I don't know if any of you have ever received one of my emails from the church, but on the bottom of it, it's got my mission statement. Right? My mission statement is, I live to inspire and motivate others to a person, purpose personal, purposeful, life-changing relationship in Jesus Christ. That's what I live to do. Okay, I wrote that. You want to know when I wrote that? Before I ever had kids. You want to know when I wrote that? Before I was ever in the ministry. I was, I was working, well, I was part-time youth pastor, but I was a full-time uh, life insurance agent. Why? Because it's not about me. I don't care what happens to me. I really don't. But I care what happens to you. And I care what happens to the other people in this world that are dying and are going to spend eternity in hell 
if they don't come into the kingdom of God. That challenges me to the core of my being. That was my life purpose before kids, after kids, before ministry, in ministry. What's yours? Many times our life purpose is, God, bless what I'm doing. Bless my business so that I can have more money, so I can go on nicer vacations, and I can afford a bigger house and a nicer boat. God, bless my retirement so I can retire early. Bless my investments. God didn't give you money for yourself. You have mo- if you have money, trust me, I didn't have, I haven't always had money. If you have money, God wants you to use it for his kingdom. He didn't do it just so you could live a cushy suburban life in Huntersville or Cornelius or Davidson or Waxhaw or Weddington or wherever else you may live. He gave us our lives so that we can point people to him. He gave us who we are so that we could invite people into his kingdom. That's what we're down here for. When you start praying like this, folks, I'm going to tell you something. He will open up doors that will blow your mind. Now, remember, not in your timing. It won't be when you think he should, and he might let you go through some really dark days. But he will open up doors to use you in ways that will absolutely amaze you. All I know is this, folks, and I want to I challenge you with this, and I'm not being morbid. I know one thing. I am going to die. I don't know when. God says, according to the Scriptures, my days are numbered according to His will. All right? I believe that to the core of my being. But this is what I do know, that when I die, all right, and if any of you know this and you're my close friend, you know this is probably what's going to happen. I'm going to run up to Jesus, and I'm going to tackle him, and I'm going to hug him, and then I'm probably going to break down and start weeping at his feet. But before that, we're going to have a big hug, and I'm probably going to punch in his arm, and then he's going to lift me up after I'm crying, and he's probably going to punch me back and say, why'd you do that? And then we're going to hug, and then he's going to tell me, good job, my faithful servant, because that is all I'm living for. That's all I want to hear. And while I'm down here, if I'm living for this while I'm down here, guess what? I have a very fulfilled life. Why? Because when this is my goal on earth, the number of people and lives that I get to interact with and focus upon and see changed is unbelievable. And you want to know why I know this is what I'm going to hear? Because he's already telling me. In spite of all my flub-ups, in spite of all my failures, when I came into his kingdom, he stopped counting my sins against me. He started showing me how free his kingdom is. And it inspires me to live sinfully less. I'm not sinless, trust me. I spend some time in repentance too. That's probably the other 30%. But when I'm there... He says, good job. And he'll open up these doors for you. He wants the same for you. But will you pray it? Will you ask God these questions so that you, will you start praying like this so that you can experience these doors of open opportunity? I don't know if you will. I know, I don't know if Hayden Jones is in here today. Is Hayden here today? He's a young man going into college, just graduated from college, and he's praying this prayer right now. His heart, God wants, he wants, he wants to go to Japan. That's where he really feels like God is leading him. But he's trying to discern right now, pray for him, that Hayden will be able to figure out, is he supposed to go to Japan or somewhere else? He knows God's calling him. He's just trying, he's going through that hard time of figuring out where. That's a tough question. But he's given God his life. I know God's going to answer his question. I don't know when. But I know he'll answer it. I, that does me so good when young people pray those prayers. Man, it's like, yes, God is calling them again. How many of us are ignoring the call? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you got to go change your occupation. All right? God's called you right where you're at. All right? Maybe he's calling. If he is, then you answer it because it'll be amazing. All right? Trust me, it'll be amazing. If that's what God's asking you to do, just go because he'll, he'll pave the way. But what he wants you to do is start praying for the people in your circle, right? He put you 
in the circle we call it in our, in our training where you live, learn, work, and play, all right, we're not asking you to go get a new job. We're not asking you to go to a new city. We're saying start looking at the circle that you live in already, right where you're at, the people that you know. Pick five people, and you might be like, well, I don't know any five people that are un unsaved. Yeah, you probably do. You're just looking at them wrong. You think, oh, I don't have any influence in your life. If they're in your circle, God will give you influence. That's the point of this prayer. God, give me influence in these people's lives. All right? God, open up doors of opportunity. And while you're praying for those five, guess what? He's going to bring 15 others in that you didn't even know were there. Why? Because your attention is upon his kingdom instead of your kingdom. When our view is upon what he's doing, we start seeing God do amazing things. And I know he wants to do that in you. He's doing that in you. Because this is what God does. This is what God does for you right here. He invites you and equips you to be your, his missionary right where you live, learn, work, and play. That's what he does. You're, you don't have to worry. Well, I, don't, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't know what I would say. If, that, if you're worried about that, come to Growth Track. We teach you verbatim what to say. It's really easy. It's not that complicated. Now, I get it. In the moment, you'd be like, oh, I, I forgot what they taught me. Okay, we make it like ABC, so it's really pretty simple. All right, so come to Growth Track. Sign up for it. little plug for Growth Track. All right. But in that moment, you don't even have to worry. If you, trust me, if you didn't go to Growth Track, that's not the answer to it all. The Holy Spirit is your answer. He will guide you. He will prompt you what to say. Because it's, it's not about the perfect words. It's about the heart. It's the condition of the heart. And God wants to use you. He will equip you right where you're at. So I want to give you these last three things to pray for. While you're, while you're thinking through this, I want to challenge you with these three things on how to pray. I want you to pray intentionally. Pray intentionally for your top five. If you don't have your top five, that's the first thing I want you to do is go home and say, God, who in the world am I praying for? And think of five people in your circle. And you might live in such a bubble, it's hard, all right? So number one, make your bubble a little bit bigger. But number two, think a little bit more clearly about who's in your bubble already, all right? There might be a postal worker, maybe someone who cuts your hair. I cut my own hair. I don't care. All right, whatever. Just find someone that doesn't know Jesus and start praying for him and, and ask God to give you an open opportunity. And then live expectantly. Okay, when you start praying that God will use you to advance his kingdom, trust me. You think Matt was talking about he'll answer your prayer? Oh, trust me, he'll answer your prayer. He will do it at the most inopportune times, too. All right? When you are in the biggest hurry, he is going to open the door wide, and you're going to be like, oh, Lord, I've got an appointment. Cancel it. No, I've, I've already canceled it three times. I'll talk to him later. Okay, is that person going to go to hell? Nope. You want to know why? Because he doesn't want anybody to perish. He's not going to send someone to hell because you missed an opportunity. He's going to give that opportunity to someone else. Someone else who just plops down, falls backwards into it, like, oh, you want to know Jesus? Oh, I got time. It is the biggest blessing. Like, we, we view this evangelism thing as some burden that we have to bear. It's a blessing. There is no greater experience than when you get to watch someone come to Christ. When, they're, when, the, when the veil is removed from their eyes, I'm telling you, if you've never experienced that, it is the most amazing moment in your Christian opportunity. Live expectantly. God's going to do it in you. And then live empowered. You're not alone. You don't have to worry. You don't have to live in fear. We're just saying, I'm not a slave to fear anymore. You didn't know that you weren't a slave to fear of witnessing. You didn't know that you weren't a slave to fear of sharing the freedom of Christ with the world. You didn't know you were a slave to fear in sharing the good news of how to get into God's kingdom. You didn't know that you were no longer a slave to fear in how to write out a new passport and give someone a new name. And it's going to change their eternity. It changes their residency. It changes their identity. They're never the same. And you, my friends have the keys to his kingdom because of what Christ did. Watch this. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I get it. Some, some still doubt. Then Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All right? Jesus has the authority to give us. We're his ambassadors. Now we have the same authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay, so it's not just about telling them about Jesus, it's about teaching them as well. There's some discipleship there. And surely I am with you always. You're not alone. You literally have the Spirit of Christ living in you to the very end of the age till you get to go run into his arms and he gets to tell you, good job, my faithful servant. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we are so grateful to be able to have this opportunity to share you with the world around us. And Lord, I know in my own life, all the times where I've been way too busy to tell someone about you, and God, all the times you had to give that blessing to someone else, Lord, I repent. God, I pray that your church here this morning would repent of all the missed opportunities that we have because of our own kingdom getting in the way. And God, I pray right now that you would help us, Lord, not to condemn ourselves, but God, that we would just start looking at your kingdom just a little bit differently, that we get to invite people into it, that it's not a burden, it's not a challenge, it's not some scary event, it's a, it's a blessing in their life and a blessing in our life. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to be aware of those that are around us that are living in a corrupt generation that are, that are being deceived, that they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're helpless without your spirit speaking to them. God, help our mind to be aware of what you're doing in their lives and give us the boldness, the boldness to just invite them into your kingdom. Oh God, that we would see your kingdom advance like the church of Acts saw it. God, the the mission field is our back door. It's our own circles. It's our own friends. It's our own workplaces. It's right where you put us. Help us to start viewing our lives the way that you view them. And God, let us live expectantly like you're actually going to answer our prayers and you could actually use little old us. We love you, Jesus. Amen.